Those of you who've been around the channel for a while know that I am a Lumix ambassador. I was invited to be on the team about eight years ago or so when the GH4 first came out. And since then, the GH5 and GH6 have come out, a complete line of full frame cameras, the S series have come out. There's even a couple of box cameras now. It's been an absolutely incredible run of cameras. Speaking of incredible, look at this view. It's amazing. Anyway, along with these incredible cameras have been some pretty incredible features, especially for filmmakers. Things like timecode support on the higher end Lumix cameras, shutter angle and synchro scan even, and full V-log support, ProRes internal recording on some of them, raw output, I mean, it's, it's incredible. What these features are, what these cameras have is nothing short of amazing, but we all know something's been missing. And look, as, as a YouTuber, as a filmmaker, I haven't found a real need for it. I haven't felt like I've been really lacking this feature, but, but you know, it's a good feature to have. I'm gonna set this camera down. It's a feature that'd be nice to have. And, you know, at some point, uh, I decided that I, I kind of wanted it. So I finally got myself a camera that has this feature that we all know is missing. Oh, by the way, th these gloves here, check these things out. These gloves are photography gloves and they have a little pouch for keeping your warming packet in. And check this out, they've even got like a little fingertip thing to, anyway, I love these gloves. Anyway, um, so I wanna show you what I'm shooting with now. So let me just get the iPhone out and uh, shoot a little video here. <laughs> Look at that, baby. That is a Lumix. That is a Lumix S5 Mark II with phase autofocus. We finally got phase. <laughs> I guess that's the whole video. See if you're on Twitter and Instagram, then back in early December, you probably noticed that a bunch of YouTubers and journalists from all around the world were in Tokyo at the same time. It was fun to see the speculation fly, and some even figured out that it was for Panasonic. I think I flew under the radar because I posted photos and videos while there that led into two other videos that I shot while I was in Japan, the GH6 open gate anamorphic video and the Laowa 6mm lens video, which of course, if you haven't seen, I'll link to down below. But the primary purpose of this trip was in fact for the Lumix S5 Mark II reveal. There was an official event where the camera was announced to a bunch of us and we were all handed an S5 Mark II and a literal pile of lenses to use for our reviews. And I say review, but of course, for me, it's, it's a little bit different. Again, I'm a Lumix ambassador, so don't expect a hard hitting review from this video. What I'll do here is highlight my favorite features because there's more than just phase autofocus to get excited about. And I'll go through a spec sheet comparison. But anyway, we're all handed the gear and Panasonic organized a tour bus to show us some highlights of the city. And we had a full day and a couple of nights to just wander and shoot and explore and test out the cameras. Admittedly, we had a lot of fun, and I have to say one thing I learned is that drinking whiskey with Josh Yo is basically an Olympic sport. Real quick, I almost never ask you to subscribe in my videos, and my wife tells me that I need to do that. I feel like it doesn't make a difference. You all know that you can sub if you want to, but she insists that it really helps. So if you're not already subscribed, please do, so I can show my wife the metrics and prove her right, because she probably is right. Thanks. All right, let's get into the weeds. I'm gonna put up a full comparison grid going feature by feature, comparing the Lumix S5 to the Lumix S5 Mark II and, and the Lumix S5 Mark II X, because yes, there are two models coming out. While the S5 Mark II is packed with video features, a few of the higher end video features are reserved for the S5 Mark II X. If you wanna follow along on another screen, I've published this entire chart on my website at photojoseph.com slash S52. Launch price for the S5 Mark II will be at the same as the S5 was at launch, 1999 US dollars. And the S5 Mark II X will be just $200 more at 2199. The image sensor is the same size at 24.2 megapixels without a low pass filter and still features the 96 megapixel high resolution mode, both in JPEG and RAW. The S5 Mark II features dual native ISO, just as its predecessor, but now as on higher end Lumix cameras, you can leave it in auto or manually choose the low or high ISO circuit. By the way, base or native ISOs for V-Log are 640 for low and 4000 for high. Stabilization, already some of the best around, has gotten an improvement. On the chart, it shows it's still five axis and five stops, but it adds active IS. 
So what does that mean? Well, Active IS is the name of the full system, which includes Dual IS 2, the latest image stabilization using both body and lens stabilization concurrently, EIS, or electronic image stabilization, which is for cropping into the sensor for adding additional wiggle room, only if you want it, and Boost IS, the other optional mode where if you're holding still, the system locks the image to mimic the camera being on a tripod. So now new algorithms and new hardware simply means better stabilization. Autofocus. Arguably the most important new feature on these cameras is, of course, phase hybrid autofocus. And compared to the S5 with 225 area autofocus, that's how many regions the scene is broken into for looking for what to focus on, the S5 Mark II features 779 point autofocus, which covers the entire sensor. We'll have a closer real world look at autofocus later on. Shutter angle is there for video shooters, but now SynchroScan support has been added, which allows you to adjust shutter angle by one degree increments. This honestly is one of the most important features to me in any camera I use to make YouTube videos, because adjusting shutter angle by one degree increments means you can bring shutter in sync with any flickering LED screen or buttons in tech products to eliminate the flicker on screen. If you don't know what shutter angle is, I have a whole video on that, which I'll link to above and below. Burst photo shooting has a massive upgrade from a max of 7 FPS in autofocus single to 30 frames per second in autofocus continuous. In RAW, that's a lot. The electronic viewfinder has a nice upgrade to a higher resolution and slightly more magnification. Here's a bunch of other specifications. Pause now if you'd like to read these. The S5 Mark II X will include internal ProRes recording. The Lumix GH6 was the first to get this, and honestly it's almost all I shoot internally on that camera. If I'm shooting to an external recorder in the field, that's usually for RAW, and the S5 does that too, but we'll come to that. For audio, another feature first introduced in the GH6 is four-channel audio recording when adding the XLR1, Panasonic's hot shoe mounted XLR interface. You can use two XLR mics plus the 3.5 millimeter mic input for a total of four audio channels. So with a simple 3.5 millimeter stereo to mono splitter, you could mic up to four people for a four person interview, giving each mic its own audio channel. Nice. You also get an upgrade to 96 kilohertz audio when using an external mic. As always with the higher end Lumix cameras, there's no recording limits. Now this isn't new, but it's being called out here explicitly. No time limitation in a zero to 40 degrees Celsius environment, which is really just to highlight how broad of a range these cameras fully operate in. Between freezing and 104 degrees Fahrenheit and you're good to go. Beyond that, and you might have some recording limitations, but the camera will perform. The Lumix S5 Mark II also gains true 24P in a cinema mode. That's 24.00 frames per second, in addition to the 23.976 frames per second. This next section has a ton of numbers, and I'm not going to read them all, but here's the highlights. The S5 Mark II and S5 Mark II X can both shoot full frame 6K in a 3-2 or 17 by 9 ratio, and full frame 5.9K in 16 by 9 at 420 10-bit up to 30P. It'll do Cinema 4K and Ultra HD at full 422 10-bit up to 60p with an APS-C crop or 30p full frame. There's also a variety of HFR frame rates, including 120p full frame in full HD. 422 10-bit S and Q modes are reserved for the S5 Mark II X, as are the all intro modes, up to 800 megabit over USB or 600 megabit internal. So yes, recording to SSD over USB will also be supported in the S5 Mark II X. Again, internal ProRes is included in the S5 Mark II X. But remember, you can always capture to ProRes with an external Atomos or Blackmagic recorder as well. The new real-time LUT feature is really cool, and I'll show this in detail later in the video, but not only can you load any LUT into the camera for preview while shooting in vlog, but now you can burn that look into the video or JPEG photos. And when I get there, I'll talk about why this is so interesting. Raw video output to a Ninja 5 Plus will be supported in the S5 Mark II X and as an optional paid upgrade to the S5 Mark II. Other external raw outputs are being worked on. Wi-Fi and Bluetooth support is all there, of course, and Bluetooth has been upgraded to version 5, which is more power efficient. Wired and wireless live streaming will be available in the S5 Mark II X, which makes it a pretty great single camera live streaming solution, whether you want to use it to go live yourself or offer it as a simple add-on service for event shooting. No fancy switching, just a simple single camera live stream for events like weddings. The HDMI port is now full size, yes, and USB has been upgraded to 10 gigabit. 
On the S5 Mark II X, the USB port also supports USB host, which is what allows it to write to a USB-C drive. Both models can also be controlled through the Lumix Tether app over USB. That busy USB port also supports USB PD for power delivery, which means you can power the camera with a battery pack. And finally, the dual UHS card slots are now both UHS 2. And again, this whole chart is on my website at photojoseph.com s 52 I figure what you're all most interested in are the autofocus tests. So let's get into it. Let's do a pretty simple autofocus demo. We're in the AF mode of full area with human detection. You'll see that I can switch this over to be human, face and eye, or animal and human. Face and eye is actually included in human. It is a hierarchy. So you'll see now as I walk into frame, it is going to grab my face. And there we have it. So it's got that face and eye detection. But the advantage of being in the human mode is that if the face and eye does disappear, for example, your subject turns around, it will still have the body. However, if you have face and eye only and they turn around, it's going to lose that subject. The advantage of having the face and eye is if you wanted to really prioritize, you don't want any objects that might be kind of getting near the face for it to snap into focus to that, that's most likely where you're going to want to use that face and eye. But for most general use, human detection is the way to go. Now I'm looking at another monitor here so I can see what actually is happening. You'll see here as I bring an object near my face, it's not snapping to it, but as soon as I start to block my face in there, it grabs onto that, it sees that object and focuses on that. Of course, it's focusing on the closest part to that. So I'm at f2 down here, so pretty well wide open on this f1.8 lens. And it is focusing on the camera here, the GH6 in this lovely condor blue cage. And we can see that it is focusing on the frontmost part of that, as you would expect. Seems to be working pretty well. I can step out of frame and I can step back into frame and the focus does what the focus is supposed to do. Let's go outside and do a little distance walk and see what happens with grabbing the body. Well, I'm just going to keep on walking towards the camera. With any luck, it'll keep on holding onto the body and at some point it is going to switch to the face detection. Let's make sure I'm not going to run over here. And uh, I'm just going to walk straight up to the camera. And we're going to see how this looks. It's simple. Look at that. It's switched over to the face. And there we have it. That, ladies and gentlemen, is face detect autofocus on the S5 Mark II. Yeah. So I'm certainly no vlogger, but I figured that with this camera, with the new autofocus, I should test it out kind of like a vlogger would. So I don't know what that means. So I'm here and now I'm looking at something over there. Let's see how the focus does. That's pretty cool. And then there's this, this thing here. I don't know what that is. Some pretty little lamp. It's kind of cool. Actually, you know what? I know what I'm going to show you. There's this really cool dragon sculpture thing. This is pretty awesome. Let's go check this out. We'll find out how close we can focus to. All right, so here we go, and check this guy out. Beautiful dragon. Let's see if we can get close to that. Yeah, look at that guy. Isn't that awesome? Sweet, sweet dragons. Love it. So cool. So, you know, I'm no Casey Neistat, but that's kind of what this camera does, like uh, how it works for vlogging. Cool. Let's go get some ramen. That looks about right. This is a little feature that I really like. You know how if you're shooting log, you can preview the footage with a Rec. 709 look on it, so you're not having to look at the flat image while shooting. You might also know that you can load your own custom LUT, one that you buy or one that you make, into the camera as well. That way, if you've already designed the look for a production, you can preview that look while shooting, but still get the log file for final grading. Well, now you can choose to burn that look into the footage instead of getting log from the camera. And at first, this might seem crazy. Like, why would you do that? Why would you limit your options in post? Well, I can think of at least three great use cases for this. First, lots of folks don't want to deal with shooting in log and adding a custom look in post, but they might want a more custom look than they can get straight from the camera. This method allows you to get essentially any look you want straight from camera with no grading required. So your custom unique look like lifted blacks, punchy reds, desaturated blues, and overall warm cast can now come straight off the camera. 
This also means that you can apply a custom look to a live stream, whether you're using the S5 Mark II X and its built-in live streaming ability, or just connecting your S5 to an ATEM. This feature lets you build a totally custom look for a live show. But what I'm personally excited about for this is actually for still photography. This look can be baked into your JPEGs too. So you can have a custom photo look straight out of camera, which means your JPEGs are ready to share. But if you shoot RAW plus JPEG, then you still have the RAW file to fall back on. If this still photo workflow is something you're interested in learning more about, let me know in the comments and maybe I'll do a dedicated video just on that. Now that's three uses, but there's potentially one more really advanced use that's specifically for those adding a Lumix S5 Mark II to a collection of Canon or Sony or some other cameras. But I'll save that for the very end of this video. I've been shooting Lumix a long time now, about a decade. Before that, I shot Canon. And fortunately, I held on to most of my Canon glass. Back when the Lumix S series full frame cameras were first released, there of course weren't that many L mount lenses available. And I even did a video on how to adapt just about anything to L mount, from PL mount cine lenses to medium format Mamiya lenses to mechanical Nikon lenses, and even included some of my modern Canon autofocus lenses. One thing that you lost though was autofocus. Well, not technically lost, autofocus did work, but it was almost unusably slow through the adapted lenses and only worked in AFS or single, never in continuous. I was curious then to see if there were any improvements in the S5 Mark II to the autofocus performance of adapted Canon lenses using the Sigma MC21 EF to L mount adapter since I already owned it. And um, wow. This entire talking head segment, which you undoubtedly noticed was in autofocus, was shot on the Canon 50mm f1.2 wide open and with a ProMIS filter as well on the new Lumix S5 Mark II. The camera is in full area autofocus with face and eye detection enabled. I found that in my test that this worked best with this lens. Now, here's a few field tests with a variety of Canon lenses. Not all lenses perform equally well, but of course, that was the case with these lenses on Canon cameras too. Regular viewers here will have noticed that I've been rigging up my cameras in cages a lot more lately. Condor Blue has in fact already designed a cage for the Lumix S5 Mark II and the Lumix S5 Mark II X, and it's a beauty. Here I've got it rigged up with the Lawa Nanomorph lenses I shot a bunch with while I was in Japan, which work both with Micro Four Thirds as well as L-mount in APS-C crop and the follow focus system from Axoon. Links to both of these videos down below. And check out this neat little detail. All the cables are being managed by these new Condor Blue Mondo ties, a collaboration project with fellow creator Armando from the Mondo Bytes channel. These little guys are awesome, and I'll link to Armando's launch video on those below, along with links to all the products you see here. Okay, bonus time. You've made it through this whole video, you've subscribed, and you've even considered signing up as a channel member to gain access to my private Discord where we regularly geek out about stuff like, well, this camera. Look for the join button down below. Anyway, I said there was another potential use for the burned in LUT. In DaVinci Resolve, you can use something called a color space transformer, CST, to move from one color space to another. You can use this to move from log to Rec. 709, to move SDR into HDR, or even to move from one log profile into another. So the idea is that you could build a CST node in Resolve that goes from Panasonic V-Log to another log profile like Canon's or Sony's or Ari's, then export a custom LUT, bring that into your S5 Mark II, and burn it into your log footage, effectively turning your V-Log into S-Log or C-Log or Ari-Log or whatever, making it easy to add the S5 Mark II into a production full of other cameras. 
Now, this is somewhat theoretical. I've built some test lots and I know this works, but I haven't been able to compare the Lumix generated C log to an actual Canon C log file or RE log to an RE file, etc. I don't have those cameras, but maybe you do. If this works, then, you know, let us know. It's a theory, but I think it'll work. Next up, catch the other S5 Mark II launch videos from all my YouTuber friends that were in Tokyo with me, or dive deep into OpenGate, which also applies to this S5 Mark II. Thank you.